Greetings and welcome. We are in the Friday session of June 1 4. And uh, it's somewhat weird to think, isn't it, Mr. Doerr? That here we are. Here I'm sorry? How much fun are we having in summer well, school? Well, we, we've learned a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's of any value, but it, it is. We, the, the young ladies in the room wanted to make the argument that women are never wrong. Well, to, wi <laughs> to which I responded to Mr. Amsbaugh that the thing we learned was that all women are convinced they think they're always right. No, we don't think they're always right. Miss Hernandez says we know. She knows. Oh, okay, so see, I'm not going to argue. You can't argue with that. Any guy that says he's got, that he runs the show is lying. Oh, no. Miss Maury even pointed like that at me with her pen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Hey, you know what? Mr. Doerr is not school principal anymore, but he still runs the world. So there you go. If he says it's true, it's true. By the way, guys, Mr. Doerr's uh, uh, memorabilia is what now is gracing our walls. So you have him to thank for some really cool stuff during break. Don't touch because it could fall off the wall, but really, you'll enjoy looking. And there's some really, really cool stuff up there. Some, maybe, before the end of summer school, I'll have Mr. Doerr come in for a 10 or 15 minute presentation, and he'll just walk you through, real quickly, some of the coolest stuff on that, on that wall. There's some really neat signed stuff by, our, by people. We call that archives, archives, when you put historical documents up in a place so that you can enjoy it. Well, that's a possibility. It is possibility. That's a possibility, but when then it is Cheyenne. See, I know I was helping Miss Vigil to make that point. I know. The only problem for me is that that's on recorded tape. So my colleagues in Cheyenne will be really. You're going to come after us? Okay, okay. Given that we are at the end of the second week, we can go ahead and celebrate that fact and also remind ourselves that now we really are on the downhill slide go, coming into to next week. Uh, with that in mind, today our focus is the following. We will be in Red Badge of Courage. We might even finish. We'll see kind of what our timing looks like. Uh, and then we will be in the afternoon back on uh, My Access uh, and then to finish, if you want to write it down on Omega Record Sheets with uh, Unstoppable Chapter 8. Unstoppable Chapter 8. All right? So we now turn to Red Badge of Courage and page... Uh, 125. 125. Chapter 20, guys. Make sure you have the date and the chapter at the top of your page. Chapter 20. When the two youths turned with the flag, they saw that much of the regiment had crumbled away, and the dejected remnant was coming slowly back. The men, having hurled themselves in projectile fashion, had presently expended their forces. They slowly retreated, with their faces still toward the spluttering woods, and their hot rifles still replying to the din. Several officers were giving orders, their voices keyed to screams. Where in hell you going? The lieutenant was asking in a sarcastic howl. And a red-bearded officer, whose voice of triple brass could plainly be heard, was commanding, Shoot into them! Shoot into them! God damn their souls! There was a melee of screeches in which the men were ordered to do conflicting and impossible things. The youth and his friend had a small scuffle over the flag. Give it to me! No, let me keep it! Each felt satisfied with the other's possession of it, but each felt bound to declare, by an offer to carry the emblem, his willingness to further risk himself. The youth roughly pushed his friend away. The regiment fell back to the stolid trees. There it halted for a moment, to blaze at some dark forms that had begun to steal upon its track. Presently it resumed its march again, curving among the tree trunks. By the time the depleted regiment had again reached the first open space, they were receiving a fast and merciless fire. There seemed to be mobs all about them. The greater part of the men, discouraged, their spirits worn by the turmoil, acted as if stunned. 
They accepted the pelting of the bullets with bowed and weary heads. It was of no purpose to strive against walls. It was of no use to batter themselves against granite. And from this consciousness that they had attempted to conquer an unconquerable thing, there seemed to arise a feeling that they had been betrayed. They glowered with bent brows, but dangerously, upon some of the officers, more particularly upon the red-bearded one with the voice of triple brass. However, the rear of the regiment was fringed with men who continued to shoot irritably at the advancing foes. They seemed resolved to make every trouble. The youthful lieutenant was perhaps the last man in the disordered mass. His forgotten back was toward the enemy. He had been shot in the arm. It hung straight and rigid. Occasionally, he would cease to remember it and be about to emphasize an oath with a sweeping gesture. The multiplied pain caused him to swear with incredible power. The youth went along with slipping uncertain feet. He kept watchful eyes rearward. A scowl of mortification and rage was upon his face. He had thought of a fine revenge upon the officer who had referred to him and his fellows as mule drivers, but he saw that it could not come to pass. His dreams had collapsed when the mule drivers, dwindling rapidly, had wavered and hesitated on the little clearing, and then had recoiled. And now the retreat of the mule drivers was a march of shame to him. A dagger-pointed gaze from without his blackened face was held toward the enemy, but his greater hatred was riveted upon the man who, not knowing him, had called him a mule driver. When he knew that he and his comrades had failed to do anything in successful ways that might bring the little pangs of a kind of remorse upon the officer, the youth allowed the rage of the baffled to possess him. This cold officer upon a monument who dropped epithets unconcernedly down would be finer as a dead man, he thought. So grievous did he think it that he could never possess the secret right to taunt truly in answer. He had pictured red letters of curious revenge. We are mule drivers, are we? And now he was compelled to throw them away. He presently wrapped his heart in the cloak of his pride and kept the flag erect. He harangued his fellows, pushing against their chests with his free hand. To those he knew well, he made frantic appeals, beseeching them by name. Between him and the lieutenant, Scolding and near to losing his mind with rage, there was felt a subtle fellowship and equality. They supported each other in all manner of hoarse, howling protests. But the regiment was a machine run down. The two men babbled at a forceless thing. The soldiers, who had heart to go slowly, were continually shaken in their resolves by a knowledge that comrades were slipping with speed back to the lines. It was difficult to think of reputation when others were thinking of skins. Wounded men were left crying on this black journey. The smoke fringes and flames blustered always. The youth, peering once through a sudden rift in a cloud, saw a brown mass of troops interwoven and magnified until they appeared to be thousands. A fierce-hued flag flashed before his vision. Immediately, as if the uplifting of the smoke had been prearranged, the discovered troops burst into a rasping yell, and a hundred flames jetted toward the retreating band. A rolling gray cloud again interposed as the regiment doggedly replied. The youth had to depend again upon his misused ears, which were trembling and buzzing from the melee of musketry and yells. The way seemed eternal. In the clouded haze, men became panic-stricken with the thought that the regiment had lost its path and was proceeding in a perilous direction. Once the men who headed the wild procession turned and came pushing back against their comrades, screaming that they were being fired upon from points which they had considered to be toward their own lines. At this cry, a hysterical fear and dismay beset the troops. A soldier, who heretofore had been ambitious to make the regiment into a wise little band that would proceed calmly amid the huge appearing difficulties, suddenly sank down and buried his face in his arms with an air of bowing to a doom. From another, a shrill lamentation rang out, filled with profane allusions to a general. 
Men ran hither and thither, seeking with their eyes roads of escape. With serene regularity, as if controlled by a schedule, bullets buffed into men. The youth walked stolidly into the midst of the mob, and with his flag in his hands, took a stand as if he expected an attempt to push him to the ground. He unconsciously assumed the attitude of the color bearer in the fight of the preceding day. He passed over his brow a hand that trembled. His breath did not come freely. He was choking during this small wait for the crisis. His friend came to him. Well, oh, Henry, I guess this is goodbye, John. Oh, shut up, you damn fool, replied the youth and he would not look at the other. The officers labored like politicians to beat the mass into a proper circle to face the menaces. The ground was uneven and torn. The men curled into depressions and fitted themselves snugly behind whatever would frustrate a bullet. The youth noted with vague surprise that the lieutenant was standing mutely with his legs far apart and his sword held in the manner of a cane. The youth wondered what had happened to his vocal organs that he no more cursed. There was something curious in this little intent pause of the lieutenant. He was like a babe which, having wept its fill, raises its eyes and fixes upon a distant toy. He was engrossed in this contemplation, and the soft underlip quivered from self-whispered words. Some lazy and ignorant smoke curled slowly. The men, hiding from the bullets, waited anxiously for it to lift and disclose the plight of the regiment. The silent ranks were suddenly thrilled by the eager voice of the youthful lieutenant bawling out, Here they come! Right on to us, by God! His further words were lost in a roar of wicked thunder from the men's rifles. The youth's eyes had instantly turned in the direction indicated by the awakened and agitated lieutenant, and he had seen the haze of treachery disclosing a body of soldiers of the enemy. They were so near that he could see their features. There was a recognition as he looked at the types of faces. Also, he perceived with dim amazement that their uniforms were rather gay in effect, being light gray, accented with a brilliant-hued facing. Too, the clothes seemed new. These troops had apparently been going forward with caution, their rifles held in readiness when the youthful lieutenant had discovered them, and their movement had been interrupted by the volley from the Blue Regiment. From the moment's glimpse, it was derived that they had been unaware of the proximity of their dark-suited foes, or had mistaken the direction. Almost instantly, they were shut utterly from the youth's sight by the smoke from the energetic rifles of his companions. He strained his vision to learn the accomplishment of the volley, but the smoke hung before him. The two bodies of troops exchanged blows in the manner of a pair of boxers. The fast, angry firings went back and forth. The men in blue were intent with the despair of their circumstances, and they seized upon the revenge to be had at close range. Their thunder swelled loud and valiant. Their curving front bristled with flashes, and the place resounded with the clangor of their ramrods. The youth ducked and dodged for a time, and achieved a few unsatisfactory views of the enemy. There appeared to be many of them, and they were replying swiftly. They seemed moving toward the blue regiment, step by step. He seated himself gloomily on the ground with his flag between his knees. As he noted the vicious wolf-like temper of his comrades, he had a sweet thought that if the enemy was about to swallow the regimental broom as a large prisoner, it could at least have the consolation of going down with bristles forward. But the blows of the antagonist began to grow more weak. Fewer bullets ripped the air, and finally, when the men slackened to learn of the fight, they could see only dark, floating smoke. The regiment lay still and gazed. Presently, some chance wind came to the pestering blur, and it began to coil heavily away. The men saw a ground vacant of fighters. It would have been an empty stage if it were not for a few corpses that lay thrown and twisted into fantastic shapes upon the sward. At sight of this tableau, many of the men in blue sprang from behind their covers and made an ungainly dance of joy. Their eyes burned and a hoarse cheer of elation broke from their dry lips. It had begun to seem to them that events were trying to prove that they were impotent. 
These little battles had evidently endeavored to demonstrate that the men could not fight well. When on the verge of submission to these opinions, the small duel had showed them that the proportions were not impossible, and by it they had revenged themselves upon their misgivings and upon the foe. The impetus of enthusiasm was theirs again. They gazed about them with looks of uplifted pride, feeling new trust in the grim, always confident weapons in their hands. And they were men. Okay, for chapter 20, a few things that happened. Henry fought a little bit with, was it Wilson, yeah. to get the flag? Yeah, Henry fought the flag. Why do you think he wanted the flag so bad? Um, he had mentioned there was confusion in the battle, kind of like what we talked about yesterday, where people with all the smoke, they would just, they didn't know where the bullets were coming from. Was it friendly fire? Was it from the enemy? Hey guys, what's that term mean, friendly fire? Do you know that term? When you shoot your own bear. Right, when someone on your own side shoots or kills you, right, friendly fire. Some people have estimated fully a third of the people who died in the American Civil War were shot by friendly fire. Uh, by any number of types, right? Cannons that would go off, bullets that would be shot, that were shot, stabbings, etc. When he got close enough to the rebel army, what did he notice about them? They had brand new uniforms on. So what do you think that meant? Ladies, what do you think the new uniforms meant? And then in the end, what happened in the battle? What? Who did? The other side. Who did? You want to be ready? Hey guys, what do you make of the fact? What do you make of the fact that Crane calls the kid the youth for most of the novel? He doesn't call it by his name. He calls him the youth. Well, he didn't call anybody by his. Yeah, right. Crane doesn't call a lot of people by their name. He kind of describes who they are, huh? Right. Which is indicative of maybe what he's playing, the game he's playing in this novel. Huh? Of course, he wants you to remember this is just a kid, right? Who's experiencing war for the first time. Okay, chapter one, middle of 131. Chapter one. 21. Did I say You said chapter one. <laughs> 21 on page 130. Chapter 21. Presently, they knew that no firing threatened them. All ways seemed once more open to them. The dusty blue lines of their friends were disclosed a short distance away. In the distance, there were many colossal noises. But in all this part of the field, there was a sudden stillness. They perceived that they were free. The depleted band drew a long breath of relief and gathered itself into a bunch to complete its trip. In this last length of journey, the men began to show strange emotions. They hurried with nervous fear. Some who had been dark and unfaltering in the grimmest moments now could not conceal an anxiety that made them frantic. It was, perhaps, that they dreaded to be killed in insignificant ways after the times for proper military deaths had passed. Or perhaps they thought it would be too ironical to get killed at the portals of safety. With backward looks of perturbation, they hastened. As they approached their own lines, there was some sarcasm exhibited on the part of a gaunt and bronzed regiment that lay resting in the shade of the trees. Questions were wafted to them. Where the hell you been? What you coming back for? Why didn't you stay there? Was it warm out there, Sonny? Going home now, boys? One shouted in taunting mimicry. Oh, mother, come quick and look at the soldiers. There was no reply from the bruised and battered regiment. 
Save that one man made broadcast challenges to fistfights, and the red-bearded officer walked rather near and glared in great swashbuckler style at a tall captain in the other regiment. But the lieutenant suppressed the man who wished to fistfight, and the tall captain, flushing at the little fanfare of the red-bearded one, was obliged to look intently at some trees. The youth's tender flesh was deeply stung by these remarks. From under his creased brows he glowered with hate at the mockers. He meditated upon a few revenges. Still, many in the regiment hung their heads in criminal fashion, so that it came to pass that the men trudged with sudden heaviness, as if they bore upon their bended shoulders the coffin of their honor. And the youthful lieutenant, recollecting himself, began to mutter softly in black curses. They turned, when they arrived at their old position, to regard the ground over which they had charged. The youth in this contemplation was smitten with a large astonishment. He discovered that the distances, as compared with the brilliant measurings of his mind, were trivial and ridiculous. The stolid trees, where much had taken place, seemed incredibly near. The time, too, now that he reflected, he saw to have been short. He wondered at the number of emotions and events that had been crowded into such little spaces. Elfin thoughts must have exaggerated and enlarged everything, he said. It seemed then that there was bitter justice in the speeches of the gaunt and bronzed veterans. He veiled a glance of disdain at his fellows who strewed the ground, choking with dust, red from perspiration, misty-eyed, disheveled. They were gulping at their canteens, fear stirring every mite of water from them, and they polished at their swollen and watery features with coat sleeves and bunches of grass. However, to the youth, there was a considerable joy in musing upon his performances during the charge. He had had very little time previously in which to appreciate himself, so that there was now much satisfaction in quietly thinking of his actions. He recalled bits of color that in the flurry had stamped themselves unawares upon his engaged senses. As the regiment lay heaving from its hot exertions, the officer who had named them as mule drivers came galloping along the line. He had lost his cap. His tousled hair streamed wildly, and his face was dark with vexation and wrath. His temper was displayed with more clearness by the way in which he managed his horse. He jerked and wrenched savagely at his bridle, stomping the hard-breathing animal with a furious pull near the colonel of the regiment. He immediately exploded in reproaches which came unbidden to the ears of the men. They were suddenly alert, being always curious about black words between officers. Oh, Thunder McChesney, what an awful bull you made of this thing, began the officer. He attempted low tones, but his indignation caused certain of the men to learn the sense of his words. What an awful mess you made. Good Lord, man, you stopped about a hundred feet this side of a very pretty success. If your men had gone a hundred feet farther, you would have made a great charge, but as it is, what a lot of mud diggers you've got anyway. The men, listening with bated breath, now turned their curious eyes upon the colonel. They had a ragamuffin interest in this affair. The colonel was seen to straighten his form and put one hand forth in oratorical fashion. He wore an injured air. It was as if a deacon had been accused of stealing. The men were wiggling in an ecstasy of excitement. But of a sudden, the colonel's manner changed from that of a deacon to that of a Frenchman. He shrugged his shoulders. Oh, well, General, we went as far as we could, he said calmly. As far as you could, did you, by God, snorted the other. Well, that wasn't very far, was it? He added, with a glance of cold contempt into the other's eyes. Not very far, I think. You were intended to make a diversion in favor of Whiterside. How well you succeeded, your own ears can now tell you. He wheeled his horse and rode stiffly away. The colonel, bidden to hearing the jarring noises of an engagement in the woods to the left, broke out in vague damnations. The lieutenant, who had listened with an air of impotent rage to the interview, spoke suddenly in firm and undaunted tones. 
I don't care what a man is, whether he is a general or what. If he says the boys did put up a good fight out there, he's a damn fool. Lieutenant, began the colonel severely. This is my own affair and I'll trouble you. The lieutenant made an obedient gesture. All right, colonel, all right, he said. He sat down with an air of being content with himself. The news that the regiment had been reproached went along the line. For a time, the men were bewildered by it. Good thunder, they ejaculated, staring at the vanishing form of the general. They conceived it to be a huge mistake. Presently, however, they began to believe that, in truth, their efforts had been called light. The youth could see this conviction weigh upon the entire regiment until the men were like cuffed and cursed animals, but withal rebellious. The friend, with a grievance in his eye, went to the youth. I wonder what he does want, he said. He must think we went out there and played marbles. I never see such a man. The youth developed a tranquil philosophy for these moments of irritation. Ah, oh, well, he rejoined. He probably didn't see nothing of it at all and got mad as blazes and concluded we were a lot of sheep just because we didn't do what he wanted done. It's a pity old Grandpa Henderson got killed yesterday. He'd have known that we did our best and fought good. It's just our awful luck, that's why. I should say so, replied the friend. He seemed to be deeply wounded at an injustice. I should say we did have awful luck. There's no fun in fighting for people when everything you do, no matter what, ain't done right. I have a notion to stay behind next time and let them take their old charge and go to the devil with it. The youth spoke soothingly to his comrade. Well, we both did good. I'd like to see the fool would say we both didn't do as good as we could. Of course we did, declared the friend stoutly. And I'd break the fellow's neck if he was as big as a church. But we're all right anyhow, for I heard one fellow say we two fit the best in the regiment. And they had a great argument about it. Another feller, of course, he had to up and say it was a lie. He seen all that was going on. He never seen us from the beginning to the end. And a lot more stuck in and says it wasn't a lie. We did fight like thunder. And they give us quite a send-off. But this is what I can't stand. These everlasting old soldiers tittering and laughing. And then that general, he's crazy. The youth exclaimed with sudden exasperation. He's a lunkhead. He makes me mad. I wish he'd come along next time. We'd show him what... He ceased because several men had come hurrying up. Their faces expressed a bringing of great news. Oh, Flynn, you just oughta heard, cried one eagerly. Heard what? said the youth. You just oughta heard, repeated the other, and he arranged himself to tell his tidings. The others made an excited circle. Well, sir, the colonel met your lieutenant right by us. It was the damnedest thing I ever heard, and he says, ahem, ahem, he says. Mr. Hasbrook, he says, by the way, who is that lad what carried the flag, he says. There, Fleming, what do you think of that? Who is the lad what carried the flag, he says. And the lieutenant, he speaks up right away. That's Fleming, and he's a Jim Hickey, he says. Right away. What? I say he did. A Jim Hickey, he says. Those are his words. He did, too, I say he did. If you can tell this story better than I can, go ahead and tell it. Hmm. Well, then keep your mouth shut. The lieutenant, he says, he's a Jim Hickey. And the colonel, he says, ahem, ahem. He is, indeed, a very good man to have. Ahem. He got the flag way to the front. I saw him. He's a good one, says the colonel. You bet, says the lieutenant. He and a fellow named Wilson was at the head of the charge and howling like Indians all the time, he says. Head of the charge all the time, he says. A fellow named Wilson, he says. <laughs> there, Wilson, my boy. Put that in a letter and send it home to your mother, eh? A fellow named Wilson, he says. And the colonel, he says, were they indeed? Ahem, ahem. My sakes, he says. At the head of the regiment, he says. They were, says the lieutenant. My sakes, says the colonel. He says, well, 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 he says. They deserve to be major generals. The youth and his friend had said, huh? You're a lion, Thompson. Oh, go to blazes. He never said it. Well, what a lie. Huh. But despite these youthful scoffings and embarrassments, they knew that their faces were deeply flushing from thrills of pleasure. They exchanged a secret glance of joy and congratulation. They speedily forgot many things. The past held no pictures of error and disappointment. They were very happy, and their hearts swelled with grateful affection for the colonel and the youthful lieutenant. Okay.
from chapter 21. So the enemy retreated, but they came back to the line. What was going on? Why? Why do you think they were mocking him? Why do you think the colonel was mad? Right. They didn't go far enough. They didn't charge far enough into the enemy line. What happened at the end? The part that I was saying something about the video was I didn't really quite understand it. Well, some men came up and said they overheard the colonel talking to the lieutenant. And he recognized that Henry and Wilson had taken the flag to the front and complimented them, basically. But what was Henry doing? What was he saying about the commanding officers just before this? He's always criticizing the commanding officers. He's very loud about it too. But now, now they're now they're great guys because they recognize these guys have the flag. <laughs> so Henry's attitude flip flops quite a bit, which probably shows his age. <laughs> Hey guys, we should probably point out too this vocabulary word that makes some of you smile because you took a biology class. Ejaculate has two meanings. So for those of you who are like, dude, really? Crane? Cut it out. You need to understand the old English use of the word to speak forcefully is ejaculate. The other meaning I'll leave to Ms. Barnes, our school biologist. Thank you. What is it like a babe? Does he mean a woman or a baby? No, good. When he, see, when he uses the term babe, understand the idiomatic use of word babe by guys today is a girl. But in Crane's day, that is not going to be the use. So it's either going to mean child or an actual infant, somebody young. Right? Can you just say baby? Shakespeare had already taught his readers of Crane's day, a babe can mean someone, like we say, babe in the woods, and it just means somebody really young, innocent, naive, dumb, that kind of thing. Okay, Bradley's up. Page 137, chapter 22. Chapter 22. <laughs> When the woods again began to pour forth the dark-hued masses of the enemy, the youth felt serene self-confidence. He smiled briefly when he saw men dodge and duck at the long screechings of shells that were thrown in giant handfuls over them. He stood erect and tranquil, watching the attack begin against a part of the line that made a blue curve along the side of an adjacent hill. His vision being unmolested by smoke from the rifles of his companions, he had opportunities to see parts of the hard fight. It was a relief to perceive at last from whence came some of these noises which had been roared into his ears. Off a short way he saw two regiments fighting a little separate battle with two other regiments. It was in a cleared space, wearing a set-apart look. They were blazing as if upon a wager, giving and taking tremendous blows. The firings were incredibly fierce and rapid. These intent regiments apparently were oblivious of all larger purposes of war and were slugging each other as if at a matched game. In another direction, he saw a magnificent brigade going with the evident intention of driving the enemy from a wood. They passed in out of sight, and presently there was a most awe-inspiring racket in the wood. The noise was unspeakable. Having stirred this prodigious uproar, and apparently finding it too prodigious, the brigade, after a little time, came marching airily out again with its fine formation in no wise disturbed. There were no traces of speed in its movements. The brigade was jaunty and seemed to point a proud thumb at the yelling wood. On a slope to the left, there was a long row of guns, gruff and maddened, denouncing the enemy who, down through the woods, were forming for another attack in the pitiless monotony of conflicts. The round red discharges from the guns made a crimson flare and a high, thick smoke. Occasional glimpses could be caught of groups of the toiling artillerymen. In the rear of this row of guns stood a house, calm and white amid bursting shells. A congregation of horses, tied to a long railing, 
were tugging frenziedly at their bridles. Men were running hither and thither. The detached battle between the four regiments lasted for some time. There chanced to be no interference, and they settled their dispute by themselves. They struck savagely and powerfully at each other for a period of minutes, and then the lighter-hued regiments faltered and drew back, leaving the dark blue lines shouting. The youth could see the two flags shaking with laughter amid the smoke remnants. Presently there was a stillness, pregnant with meaning. The blue lines shifted and changed a trifle and stared expectantly at the silent woods and fields before them. The hush was solemn and church-like, save for a distant battery that, evidently unable to remain quiet, sent a faint rolling thunder over the ground. It irritated, like the noises of unimpressed boys. The men imagined that it would prevent their perched ears from hearing the first words of the new battle. Of a sudden, the guns on the slope roared out a message of warning. A spluttering sound had begun in the woods. It swelled with amazing speed to a profound clamor that involved the earth and noises. The splitting crashes swept along the lines until an interminable roar was developed. To those in the midst of it, it became a din fitted to the universe. It was the whirring and thumping of gigantic machinery, complications among the smaller stars. The youth's ears were filled cups. They were incapable of hearing more. On an incline over which a road wound, he saw wild and desperate rushes of men perpetually backward and forward in riotous surges. These parts of the opposing armies were two long waves that pitched upon each other madly at dictated points. To and fro they swelled. Sometimes one side by its yells and cheers would proclaim decisive blows, but a moment later the other side would be all yells and cheers. Once the youth saw a spray of light forms go in hound-like leaps toward the waving blue lines. There was much howling, and presently it went away with a vast mouthful of prisoners. Again he saw a blue wave dash with such thunderous force against a gray obstruction that it seemed to clear the earth of it and leave nothing but trampled sod. And always in their swift and deadly rushes to and fro, the men screamed and yelled like maniacs. Particular pieces of fence or secure positions behind collections of trees were wrangled over as gold thrones or pearl bedsteads. There were desperate lunges at these chosen spots seemingly every instant, and most of them were bandied like light toys between the contending forces. The youth could not tell from the battle flags flying like crimson foam in many directions which color of cloth was winning. His emaciated regiment bustled forth with undiminished fierceness when its time came. When assaulted again by bullets, the men burst out in a barbaric cry of rage and pain. They bent their heads in aims of intent hatred behind the projected hammers of their guns. Their ramrods clanged loud with fury as their eager arms pounded the cartridges into the rifle barrels. The front of the regiment was a smoke wall penetrated by the flashing points of yellow and red. Wallowing in the fight, they were, in an astonishingly short time, re-smudged. They surpassed in stain and dirt all their previous appearances. Moving to and fro with strained exertion, jabbering all the while, they were, with their swaying bodies, black faces, and glowing eyes, like strange and ugly fiends, jigging heavily in the smoke. The lieutenant, returning from a tour after a bandage, produced from a hidden receptacle of his mind new and portentous oaths suited to the emergency. Strings of expletives he swung lash-like over the backs of his men, and it was evident that his previous efforts had in no wise impaired his resources. The youth, still the bearer of the colors, did not feel his idleness. He was deeply absorbed as a spectator. The crash and swing of the great drama made him lean forward, intent-eyed, his face working in small contortions. Sometimes he prattled, words coming unconsciously from him in grotesque exclamations. He did not know that he breathed, that the flag hung silently over him. So absorbed was he. A formidable line of the enemy came within dangerous range. They could be seen plainly, tall.
tall, gaunt men with excited faces running with long strides toward a wandering fence. At sight of this danger, the men suddenly ceased their cursing monotone. There was an instant of strained silence before they threw up their rifles and fired a plumping volley at the foes. There had been no order given. The men, upon recognizing the menace, had immediately let drive their flock of bullets without waiting for a word of command. But the enemy were quick to gain the protection of the wandering line of fence. They slid down behind it with remarkable celerity, and from this position they began briskly to slice up the blue men. These latter braced their energies for a great struggle. Often white clinched teeth shone from the dusky faces. Many heads surged to and fro, floating upon a pale sea of smoke. Those behind the fence frequently shouted and yelped in taunts and jive-like cries, but the regiment maintained a stressed silence. Perhaps at this new assault, the men recalled the fact that they had been named mud diggers, and it made their situation thrice bitter. They were breathlessly intent upon keeping the ground and thrusting away the rejoicing body of the enemy. They fought swiftly and with a despairing savageness denoted in their expressions. The youth had resolved not to budge, whatever should happen. Some arrows of scorn that had buried themselves in his heart had generated strange and unspeakable hatred. It was clear to him that his final and absolute revenge was to be achieved by his dead body lying, torn and gluttering upon the field. This was to be a poignant retaliation upon the officer who had said mule drivers and later mud diggers, for in all the wild graspings of his mind for a unit responsible for his sufferings and commotions, he always seized upon the man who had dubbed him wrongly. And it was his idea, vaguely formulated, that his corpse would be, for those eyes, a great and salt reproach. The regiment bled extravagantly. Grunting bundles of blue began to drop. The orderly sergeant of the youth's company was shot through the cheeks. Its supports being injured, his jaw hung afar down, disclosing in the wide cavern of his mouth a pulsing mass of blood and teeth. And with it all, he made attempts to cry out. In his endeavor, there was a dreadful earnestness, as if he conceived that one great shriek would make him well. The youth saw him presently go rearward. His strength seemed in no wise impaired. He ran swiftly, casting wild glances for succor. Others fell down about the feet of their companions. Some of the wounded crawled out and away, but many lay still, their bodies twisted into impossible shapes. The youth looked once for his friend. He saw a vehement young man, powder-smeared and frazzled, whom he knew to be him. The lieutenant also was unscathed in his position at the rear, he had continued to curse, but it was now with the air of a man who was using his last box of oaths. For the fire of the regiment had begun to wane and drip. The robust voice that had come strangely from the thin ranks was growing rapidly weak. Okay. Quick review of chapter 22. And something that was also mentioned in uh, 21... So they went from being called mule drivers to what? What did Is that a more positive or negative name than mule drivers? Negative. So they came under attack. And what's Henry doing the whole time? Watching. Watching and holding the flag. And who did he observe was still standing at, at the end of this chapter? His friend. His friend. Right. And the lieutenant. Does it look like they're going to win the battle? Not really. Okay, chapter 23. We're going to go ahead, guys, and finish the novel today. 23-24, chapter 23-24, and then go to uh, Ms. Laird, our uh, critical analysis.
following day that's on our, that's on our table board. That'll set us up for the viewing of the next next Monday. Oh, great. Okay. Chapter 23. The colonel came running along the back of the line. There were other officers following him. We must charge him, they shouted. We, we must charge him, they cried with resentful voices, as if anticipating a rebellion against this plan by the men. The youth, upon hearing the shouts, began to study the distance between him and the enemy. He made vague calculations. He saw that to be firm soldiers, they must go forward. It would be death to stay in the present place, and with all the circumstances to go backward would exalt too many others. Their hope was to push the galling foes away from the fence. He expected that his companions, weary and stiffened, would have to be driven to this assault, but as he turned toward them he perceived with a certain surprise that they were giving quick and unqualified expressions of assent. There was an ominous clanging overture to the charge when the shafts of the bayonets rattled upon the rifle barrels. As they yelled words of command, the soldiers sprang forward in eager leaps. There was new and unexpected force in the movement of the regiment. The knowledge of its faded and jaded condition made the charge appear like a paroxysm, a display of the strength that comes before a final feebleness. The men scampered in insane fever of haste racing as if to achieve a sudden success before an exhilarating fluid should leave them. It was a blind and despairing rush by the collection of men in dusty and tattered blue, over a green sward and under a sapphire sky, toward a fence dimly outlined in smoke, from behind which sputtered the fierce rifles of enemies. The youth kept the bright colors to the front. He was waving his free arm in furious circles, the while shrieking mad calls and appeals, urging on those that did not need to be urged. For it seemed that the mob of blue men hurling themselves on the dangerous group of rifles were again grown suddenly wild with an enthusiasm of unselfishness. From the many firings starting toward them, it looked as if they would merely succeed in making a great sprinkling of corpses on the grass between their former position and the fence. But they were in a state of frenzy perhaps because of forgotten vanities, and it made an exhibition of sublime recklessness. There was no obvious questioning, nor figurings, nor diagrams. There was apparently no considered loopholes. It appeared that the swift wings